All right, we are live. Welcome to another edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. My name is Todd Rosales and I am your host. Um, I am really excited about our guest today. And, and guys, I know I say that every day, but you know, it amazes me the quality of guests that we're actually able to get on this show, um, having only been around since February. But uh, our guest today is the founder and CEO of one of my favorite companies in the industry. And we'll get back to that in just a second. Um, for those of you that have been really enjoying our content, please go and subscribe to us on YouTube. You can find us at Elevate Your Grind on our YouTube channel. And then if you want to check out more about Cannabis Lab, the group that allows me to do this, the group that supports this podcast, and realistically, the only reason that I'm still in this industry, check us out at www.joincelab.com. Uh, you can probably see tomorrow we're going to post our investment panel from last week, an awesome panel to check out. And then this week, I'm really excited. We have our branding and marketing panel, which is going to be hosted by our very own Evan Bopp. Uh, again, guys, Evan deserves all the credit for Elevate Your Grind. Actually, I was just talking to our, desk, our guest today about he, one time he, he started a podcast and the hardest part of it was the editing and everything else. And maybe we'll get into that conversation a little bit, but Evan does all of that for me. Um, Evan, really, he, he's a student at UM and he works harder than me. He works harder than Robert and he, he's got a bright future ahead of him. So I'm really excited to see Evan anchoring that panel with um, the CMO of TrueLeave, Valda Coriat, uh, Rosie Matteo, Yesenia Garcia, Jared Mursky, and again, Evan's going to be moderating that panel. So check it out tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Eastern, and you can register for that event at joincelab.com. Um, please, if you're going to register and you're not a member yet, just register as a guest of a member. Use my name, Todd Rosales, and we'll let you into the event for free. Uh, for those of you that have no interest in interacting with the panelists, you can check us out on Facebook Live where you're watching this episode at the Canna Business Group. Um, back to my guest today. My guest today has been in the business, I want to say since 2004. So for those of you keeping score at home, that was well before 2010 where it was legalized in Colorado. And I guarantee you that each and every one of you have either used a product from this organization wanted a product from this organization, um, or are familiar with this organization. So I'm very pleased to welcome my guest, Dave Daly, the founder and CEO of Grav Labs. How's it going? Oh, it is going amazing, my friend. I, I'm so excited to have you because you are literally one of the OGs of the cannabis industry, right? You've been in it since 2004, well since before it was legal, and now you're getting to see the industry mature. How has that feeling been, you know, being in this industry realistically six years before it truly existed? Um, you know, honestly, it doesn't feel like a big feather in the cap. I, um, you know, the time flies by. I, and when you go out to places like California and you start to talk to some of these people in cannabis, like, you know, it's, it really gets watered down when you meet with people who are every single, you know, bro out there is like, man, I've been doing this since 1994, you know, before. And, you, and you're like, all right, my, my, my clout is just no longer important. Um, but, uh, but it's been a long road. I mean, I can tell you that it was, um, it was really, I mean, it's still is scary. I mean, we're, we're not, we're, you know, especially with what's going on in the world right now. I mean, we're, yeah. we're we got a long way to go to, to get to where, you know, cannabis should be. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we had our own fears in a different way. I mean, cannabis was illegal and, but you know, the, the criminality was, you know, a lot of the, it was, was cast through um, paraphernalia. I mean, there, there was a lot of people that were, caught because they got caught with a pipe. I mean, it wasn't, you, you didn't have to get caught with weed. You could get just caught, get caught with a pipe in your car and you're going to jail. Um, which was always a big challenge for me when I started the company. It was a, um, it, it, so first of all, we're in Texas. I should say like as a, as a background, that's- In, in one of the greatest cities everywhere. in the country, Austin. Yeah, in Austin. I wanna add. That, that was strategic. When I started, I started the company actually out of my, parents garage in Houston when I was I moved back in with my folks after I uh, graduated from UT here and then uh, went traveling for a while moved back in with them and had the idea for the gravity bomb uh, the gravitron and uh, yeah. yeah that was that was the start of it no four that that's really cool so I, I think what a lot of people don't realize is grav almost started or not almost started it was kind of a side hustle for you at first not saying it was a way to add extra money but 
you were a mortgage broker when you started Graph, and, and that was how you paid your bills. Um, but talk to me, how did you get the idea? Because you know, I, I went to college, I think a little bit after you, if I remember correctly, it was, it was uh, late 90s, like 98, 99 that you were talking about. So I was in college 2004 to 2008, and we were making similar uh, gravity bongs to what you were talking about. But how did you take this idea and say, hey, this, this thing that we use at parties at college, I can make a business around that, especially when, when it, you're doing it for an illegal substance? Yeah, the, 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 obviously I was enamored with cannabis and I, I just saw it was you know, kind of like the, the hacker in the dorms that was like, you know, the guy that always rolled the joints and made the bongs, that was me. And so I got out of school and I was, you know, hustling, trying to, I thought I was going to go to law school. And then I decided I was going to go you know, be a mortgage broker for a while because that's what my, my dad did slash does. So I learned his job, which was very cool, but also like a terrible business to be in at the time and, and really still is. Um, but the, um, you know, but what it did was drive me to say, Hey, look, I want to, I was, I still am an avid reader and, um, and I was reading a book by Tom Robbins that, you know, was all about like immortality and the way that humans make their mark on the world. And, um, and I just wanted to make something that people loved. And, you know, that's really been my guiding light throughout the, my entire career is just continue to make objects that people love that are bigger than me that are going to live past me. So um, when I looked at the landscape, I was like, well, I know how to make this gravity bong out of glass. And I think I can pull this off in a more commercialized way. And so I set it out, I set out to just make that one thing. And, um, and it took a long time. I mean, even, you know, it wasn't like magic in 04, all of a sudden we started selling a million of these things. It was, um, it was a, a really long three year slog to, to learn exactly how to get proficient and not only making that one product, but learning that people were going to buy, you know, that, that I couldn't be a one trick pony, that we needed to be able to make other objects other than a gravity bong. Cause not everybody was going to smoke out of a gravity bong, um, that people loved. Yeah. I, I mean, so uh, again, it's funny. I, for a while I was keeping my personal use off, off talking on this show, but it, you know, obviously being in the industry, it just kind of comes up. I've attempted to use a gravity bong in recent times and I don't know if my lungs still have the capacity that I had in college because I certainly cannot clear one anymore like I used to. Um, so I can see the need to expand beyond the Gravitron as your consumers age as well. Um, but how, I mean, it, it, so, you know, I, I read while you're reading, while you were building this company, I mean, you basically just learned everything as you went. So, you know, I'm very fascinated with entrepreneurship, right? Because when you're young, you look at adults, you look at people in business and you assume that they know what they're doing, that they have all their shit together. I mean, with you, it was trial error. I don't know how to do this. I'm going to go learn how to do this. Okay. I saw this dude do it. Now I took some pictures of it and, and I, I noticed, I love how you always say how you took out your flip phone, took some pictures of it. And then I went and reverse engineered it the last day or the next day. Would you say like, a lot of your success has been on your ability to find people to educate you and then reverse engineer what they're doing? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Like I, the, every step of the way, I mean, even that Gravitron story was, you know, the most amazing exercise and design that, you know, you could ever imagine that it's, it's amazing how many times as you're building something, most people say, Oh, you can't do it that way. Or, Oh, it doesn't work this way. Or, you know, this, you know, that, uh, you know, that design, people aren't going to like that. Or you know, there's so much speculation and so many, so many pitfalls that people fall into about what, you know, about pure speculation that people, that people in their lives, you know, really dis diminish their, you know, their enthusiasm. And that was, um, you know, that was certainly the case in 04 where, you know, I'm coming from a conservative Jewish, you know, family in Houston and, you know, everybody's, you know, you know, it's, it was, I was the butt of the joke for a long time. And, um, and so it's, I mean, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit here, but, you know, I have to give props to my parents who are always super supportive outside of that, you know, you know, larger community. They were always in my, in my, uh, in my camp, but, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the grit that it takes is, is really, you know, I, I think that 
it's more about curiosity and, and just not taking no for an answer. Um, but also knowing when it's time to quit. I mean, that's, I would, I would say that my, my biggest successes are my failures, right? Like there's for every, you know, great product that people have used, it's, you know, grab product, there's 10 behind it that didn't work. Right. Yeah. The, you know, what you, what you don't see is far greater than what you do. And the, the products that we're most proud of are the, are the products that took us the longest to bring to market. Um, you know, the gravit, you know, the Gravitron being one of them. I mean, it's still, um, it's still up there in our top selling SKUs as, you know, as amazing as it is, this gravity bong that every single person from day one said, Oh, I can make one of those at home. You know, to which I've always said, you can make any pipe at home. <laughs> <laughs> you can take That's an Ozarka bottle and turn it into a pipe. You don't need to, you know, the, but these, uh, you know, these, these products end up being timeless. And that's, that's the hardest part I would say about, you know, being a product designer and, but by no means do I think that I'm a great product designer. I've just been, you know, designing glass pipes my entire career. I just know that, um, <clears throat> that the most important aspect is that, you know, you're laser focused on what is going to be a lasting classic product and not compromising on at the beginning, but also I mean, it's, it's a fine line. I mean, uh, Seth Godin is one of my most favorite writers, speakers, okay. and he says it best. It's like, you know, ship it. The moment that you have an idea, bring it to market and start getting feedback from people. And that's always what we've done and iterated and improved. And, um, and that's why you see us constantly bringing out new products is that, you know, there's, there's always improvement. Um, but that's, that's only one piece of the puzzle. The hardest piece for me was really scaling the business. And that's, that's where it, it became, you know, the biggest challenge, I would say. So first off, tangents are absolutely encouraged on this show. Um, anytime we have any kind of a structured story, either I like to throw curveballs or I like our guests going off on tangents because I think that's where you get the most information. And there's about five of them I'm struggling to figure out which one to, to go down. But let's and, and I want to get into the products because you know I'm a huge fan of your products. But going back to your story, you mentioned two things is is knowing when to continue and knowing when to quit. And then also, you know, the biggest challenge for you was scaling your company. You know, this is not uh, hidden information. I've seen you talk about it, it in interviews, but at one point with your company, you guys were, were growing, you were selling, but you weren't making any money. You were $80,000 in personal credit card debt. And you unfortunately had to, to get rid of most of the company, including some close friends. You know, you think at that point, a lot of people in your life would have looked at you and said, Dave, what are you doing, man? You had to get rid of everybody. You're, you're in personal debt. You don't really have any assets. You know, I think you said it yourself. If I liquidated everything in the company, I wouldn't even be able to cover that debt. I would think, I mean, I hate to say it. I think you should, there might've been a, a, a time when you should have quit and you didn't. And because you didn't, you are where you are today. You know, what, what was that like? I mean, how do you, I imagine the hardest part, and I know I'm asking a lot of questions here, is going from the CEO who starts the company and kind of leads the design to now like, okay, we've got a successful, I don't want to call it a proof of concept, but we've got a successful startup. Now we have to make it function like a, a, a well-oiled machine, you know, switching that mindset. So, so take us through, you know, what was it like in those dark times and how did you kind of come out of that to, to continue and build what you did? Well, um, you know, it's a great question and I'm not, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you bring it up because I haven't talked about it in a long time. Actually, that interview you're talking about is a pretty old one. 2013, um, but it was a really yeah. good one. And, um, I don't, I don't like to talk about it because it's an uncomfortable conversation, but the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the fact is that when, you know, it's not worth, it's not worth the details of how I got there, but you know, when this is a good moment to bring up a little, you know, to recognize some privilege, which I think we should all be doing right now. And, um, and realize that my, you know, like my dad has, who's, who's always been in my camp, you know, was one of the ones that was like, Hey, it's time to, it's time to shit or get off the pot. One of his favorite sayings. And, um, and I knew that 
there was only one thing that I could possibly do. And that was to, you know, to just to, to start to grow faster. And in order to do that, I needed to buy a few glass blowing machines and hire some people. And in order to do that, I needed about 10 grand. And, you know, it's nothing in today's money. And by the way, we're talking about 2007 when, you know, startup and venture, I and mean, look, there were people obviously raising money in venture, in venture capital, yeah. existed, but not like it does today. I mean, like, this, yeah. We have a whole venture capital complex um, that 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 wasn't even in on my radar. It was just how do I you know pull my bootstraps up you know a little harder myself. And so I you know I was able to go to my dad and ask for that, and um, and he lent me that money. And I you know I, I'm sure I might have been able to find it somewhere else, but it was it was not uh, you know this is this is again my privilege, right? Like I have. A family that not only was like, sure, go make bongs, but also, hey, here's some money to do it. Um, yeah. I mean, I had run. I, I was proud to have you know run my lifestyle that as I as I wanted for three years and only come up for air, 80, 80 grand in debt, and that was the way he looked at it. He was like, hey, look, you know, you could have run up three years worth of of you know debt in you know education right you could have gone to to yeah. get an mba and you know, and that would have cost you way more than 80 grand so hey here's here's 10 don't fuck it up and don't call me for more and um and so the the answer to me wasn't necessarily hey let's you know you know oh what am i going to do am i going to quit quitting was never even an option it was like okay i'm going to i'm going to make something of this or i'm going to literally just you know just burned down in, in beautiful flames. Um, cause I always knew that at the end of the day I could get really, really scrappy, right? Like the, I, I would, you know, this is, this is to say that I really knew, I knew my, I knew my cost of doing business. And despite okay. the fact that I was burning through cash, I knew that I could get really, really small and still not, you know, die on the vine you know, kind of like you're doing, you know, in your garage, I, you know, I shouldn't, you know, call you out on this, but like all of us are, please, <laughs> all of us are, are, we're, I mean, I was literally doing this out of my garage and then I'd moved into the big warehouse and I hired the people and I took out all the ads and I was going to all the trade shows. If I cut all those things out and I went back to my garage and I just made Gravitrons by myself and one hitters by myself, I knew I would be able to crawl out of that debt. You know, it might've taken me a lot longer, but I would be able to do it. And so that's, that was one of the things that prevented me from the just sheer fear of running the, or well, the, the, the inevitability of potentially running the other way and the, you know, and the fear of doing so. So the, you know, I was, I got my MBA in, you know, in pipe making from 2004 to 2007 and not just pipe making, but, but servicing head shops and what has ultimately become dispensaries. And, you know, from then on, it was a race to design products better, faster, and at a greater scale than anybody else in the country. And we've done that pretty well. Dude, I mean, listen, I, I understand that, that, you know, you had to do what you had to do and, and there was some privilege involved with, with, you know, your dad, but I give you uh, so much credit for just having to make that decision because I can only imagine how hard it was and, and how tough it was to think, you know, we kind of built this, but in order for me to get through this tough time, it's got to be on me and I've got to do this and I've got to get small and scale. And I'm sure that was one of the hardest decisions you ever had to make, but it just goes to a testament of how passionate you were and how much you believed in what you've created. And I can only imagine the, the people who work for you now I'm sure they would go through a wall for you because of how passionate you are and how dedicated you are. And the fact that you literally do this in your garage twice, um, you know, I, I can only imagine what the culture is like at Grav today. Uh, I wish I could take credit for a great culture. Um, you know, we've, every company, every company struggles with culture and ours is no different. I mean, I've, I've, I've had my own, um, my own, um, blunders when it comes to building a great team. And in fact, that's one of the things that I'm realizing that I, uh, that I still struggle with. My, my, my core competency is not in managing people. You know, I'm, I'm a much more, um, I'm a much better connector of, um, you know, 
kind of a um, I'm struggling to to put it to words, but you know my, where this is coming from is that I recently hired. I had a quite a year. I got married. I had a baby. I had a baby. Well, Congratulations on that, by the way. That was uh, like a, what two weeks ago? Uh, three three weeks ago. So yeah, I'm a little also kind of <laughs> not. I, I get it. My, mine's uh, mine's crying about forty feet that way. I'm trying to keep the microphone down so you don't hear it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um but you know, in addition to you know to 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 marrying my best friend, I also um, took on a partner um, in my business who happens to be my lifelong best friend and you know, someone who I you know have the most admiration for, and has come in and really shown me what it means to build culture at an organization. And um, I uh, you know less than a year into this engagement, I, I can't imagine this business without him. I mean, obviously he's been, a, he's been with me, you know, as my best friend throughout the last 16 yeah. years, but, um, but now he's, you know, now he's officially um, my partner in the, in the organization and, and learning from him has been over the last year has been just like exceptional. I mean, to see that the, it's, it's one thing you can, you can grow a company through brute force. Um, by designing great products and pricing them right, but you, but to scale a company to be a globally recognized, you know, well-oiled organization, you have to build incredible culture, and it takes very smart people to do that. And um, and I, I I hope that I can get better at it always. Um, and I hope that my, the people within my organization get better at it and we all, you know, can grow together. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the lesson here for, for people who are watching this to take home, at least what I'm taking out from it is, you know, you may not have done everything right. You may not have made every right decision, but when you made, and we don't need to call them wrong decisions, but when you made missteps and you had failures that you learned from those failures and you figured out how to move past them you know, to first, there's a lot of CEOs out there that can't recognize that they're not great managers of people and they don't step down from those roles. And unfortunately, you know, companies suffer because of it. So I think it's absolutely incredible that you're able to recognize that in yourself. You're able to learn from the things that you're good at and not good at and build a company. Um, you know, I, I know that we've, we've gone down a little bit of a somber tone here, but I think it's all super important to your story and what you're doing. But Going back to where you were before, you know, you started out with the Gravitron and I, I you know, I, that interview that you did in 2013 was absolutely great and gave me a ton of information. Probably half the questions I'm going to ask you came from there, but you know, at one point you realized that you needed a way to promote. So you created this right here and, and I actually have a piece of white paper in it just so you can see the logo, but uh, this is this is the taster, right? And you started giving this out at ACL. And if I remember the story correctly, someone said, Hey, we're interested in these. Yeah. Um, yeah. The taster story is a great one. And, and again, and like, I don't, I don't want to hard back on this. I will happily move on, but I, no, uh, please do. It's your story. Um, no, but I just, I'm really in this moment of time where we're, where I'm trying to recognize all of my privilege and, understanding what it means to be, live in a fundamentally, you know, corrupt and racist society. And, um, and I think it's okay to go down this somber tone. And I just want to be able to, to embrace that when we have the opportunity. Um, so, you know, just, just bringing that out and want to just be open with you about it. Um, I think it's, it's, it's something that's really high on my list of priorities right now. So, um, I, I'm happy to move past it, but I, I want to just embrace it, if that's okay. No, I, and absolutely. We, I mean, we can continue to go down this way. I mean, no, you're, you're right, man. I mean, there's a lot of us that have opportunities um, because of our privilege. I mean, I'm, I'm in that boat as well, too. I, I don't disagree with you. The fact that I'm able to sit in my house and I'm able to get this equipment to try to build this show, you know, it, it's a testament there. I've got people that have helped me out along the way. Um, but I, I think there's a lot to your story that it, it's just, I think a lot of people can learn from it. Right. And even the fact of what you're talking about right now, that you are a successful, 
you know, let's, let's be honest, you're a successful white person in the state of Texas, a very conservative state. You also have to be working in the cannabis industry and the fact that you're able to take a step back, look at your flaws, the flaws of society. And that kind of resonates with you. Like, Hey, you know, I may not, I don't know if I've been recognizing this along the way, but you know, I, I don't think, I don't even think, I don't think you're that much older than me. Um, I'm 33 and, and you're able to take a step back and say, I've got to do something to change this in my life. The fact that you're able to bring in your best friend to your business, the fact that you're able to come back and, and build that business from everywhere. I think all of that is, is absolutely great. Um, I'm just so enamored with your story that there's so many different things I want to talk about that, that that's, the, that's honestly the problem I'm having more. Um, you know, what, let, let's staying on that tone. What do you think is, is, has led you to the point where you're able to reflect like this? Is it marrying your best friend? Is it having, I think you said it was your second child. Um, you know, what, what's really brought this self-reflection? Um, well, so, so Brandon, who's my business partner, um, he, uh, he and his wife have been, you know, really passionate activists um, for this cause for a while, more, more so his wife than, than him. But, um, and, you know, he's, he's set the tone in, internally with Grav that this is a moment where we need to self, we need to be spending as much time as possible reflecting on what we can do as an organization to not turn a blind eye to what's going on in the world. And, um, you know, I give him that credit and, you know, for good reason. I mean, I, I've been really trying to stay present at home with my wife and kid. And, um, and of course, you know, as you spend a lot of time just sitting around thinking, not working, you know, you do have this opportunity to, uh, you know, to reflect. So, you know, I, I don't mean to throw it off, you know, to throw you off on a different co topic of, of conversation. And I'm happy to, I could go on forever about design and the taster story and how amazing it was and, um, and how the tasters led to this and that. And I'm happy to go down that route. I just, I just wanted to, to stop all of us for a second because I think that, that we owe it to the world to be like, hey, Somber's okay right now. And then we can move on, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, my... My answer to, to you know to what gives me that opportunity or what you know what makes me you know want to take time to to reflect is that I just think that it's the right thing to be doing right now you know straight up I mean it's not it's not necessarily influenced by um, by any one person individually but the fact that I live downtown Austin in quarantine where there's people marching all around me. I can't get out of my parking garage. They're painting the streets. There's looting going on. There's, you know, it's, it's a very real moment. And, yeah. um, and it's, and, and this is, I mean, I just, you know, mark my words, you know, we're going to look back on this conversation and this is going to be yet another pivot in a lot of organizations, you know, strategy you know, of, of how they speak to their customers, how they show up with product, how they, um, how they scale their organizations in the future. Um, you know, this, this moment is going to change things. So I just, I just I, think it's, it's uh, important to recognize. I, I hope you're right. And I, I think you're right. And you know, if, if I can add anything to it before we move on, and I appreciate you keeping it on this tone, because you're right. It is absolutely important. I do believe for the most part, and it's certainly not perfect that the cannabis industry has done a better job than most of being inclusive. Um, we have people of color, we have minorities, we have people who are, um, you know, of, of L, LBGTQ plus, um, and I'm sorry if I left out any letters there, um, um, but, you know, we have a lot of that in this industry. And I remember I, I actually met with a CEO of a company out in Denver, and he said, you know, people who don't fit in in other places feel like they fit in here. Um, you know, a lot of the old school cannabis guys will tell you that this plant, this industry, this whole thing that we have is one of inclusion. Now, it is far from perfect because it is still an industry and still a corporation. But, you know, I hope that that our industry can at least be somewhat of a light example for, for others. And it, like I said, it, it's far from perfect, but at least showing that, you know, 
there can be a lot of powerful women CEOs and minority CEOs and, and other executives. And they're just as good, if not better than the ones in other industries. Um, so I hope, I hope you're right about this being a turning point. And I agree with you. You know, you had mentioned that you come from a conservative Jewish family earlier. I'm, I'm Jewish as well. And I think people like you and I growing up, we deal with a very light moniker of, of, I don't want to say racism, but anti-Semitism, but it's mostly just jokes and insults. But so they're, they're harmless in a way, but it doesn't make you feel good. I can only imagine if you took that and increased it a hundredfold. And, you know, and it was the system that was, was saying this to you, not just some people. I don't know if you experienced that growing up, but I can imagine, you know, I had to deal with some BS growing up, but it's not even close to what people, you know, uh, what, what people I know are dealing with. Um, I don't really know where to go with this, but that's just kind of, you know, what's in my head based on, on what you were just saying. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I just appreciate you giving it its moment and for us to, you know, have the conversation. I haven't talked to many people outside of my own organization and, you know, I can't speak to the statistics in the cannabis industry, but I know, I know it has a long way to go and I know that Grav has a long way to go too. So, um, so yeah, no, I mean, look, this is, this is a, it's, it's just important to have this moment and I appreciate you giving it to me. No, absolutely, man. I, I appreciate you you contributing to the show. This is, you know, for the most part, this show has been who are you and what is your story? But I think, you know, I, I appreciate you bringing up something that needs to be brought up on the show, something I've been hesitant to just because, you know, I'm still educating myself as well. And, and I don't want, even though my platform is small, I don't want to say misstep and say anything that's not correct on here, right? And not because I'm worried about people coming after me. Listen, you want to take away my little BS show because I said something wrong, go after it. I just, I want to make sure that I'm representing the facts right and I'm representing the people um, that, that, that are actually in this fight correctly. I mean, looking at, at the Dave Chappelle special, he said it best, not that I'm a celebrity, but he said the streets are the ones that need to do the talking right now and that's who we need to listen to. But um, no, I'm glad that we did this, but at some point I do need to transition back into your story. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I'm certainly, I, I am not the, I, I, I love too much comedy and everything else to become the person who's going to be the radio host of this movement, but let's go, let's go back to these tasters. You gave these out at ACL. I mean, dude, these besides ignore the piece of paper in there, but these things are absolutely incredible. It's like the perfect size. It's very discreet. Um, and they're cheap enough that you can buy a handful of them and just kind of almost make them disposable. Well, interesting you say that, you know, we've, we've, uh, the, so the, ta the, the taster story is a great one. In a nutshell, it was really the thing that brought me out of that debt, right? So we talked about the $80,000 in debt. Um, that was very real. And the tasters were one of those moments where I was, I was creating this product that was basically a giveaway, a promo item. And I saw one of my head shops there. It was you know, an incredible lesson in design and pricing because, you know, this is a, you know, a, a product that cost me very little to make. And, you know, when, it, when I'm making it myself and, um, and I was able to, you know, to, you know, enough to where I could like hand them out and I would put a little weed in there and throw them at people and they would love that, you know, free weed and a free pipe. And then I saw, ran into um, Mick from the gas pipe, which the gas pipe is no more. Um, and he was like, hey, these are awesome. Come see me on Monday or whenever it was. And I kicked it out a couple of weeks and put them together in a nice rack. And um, I show up and, you know, he's like, okay, how much? And, you know, when you're, you gotta understand the pipe culture, right? Like this is 2007 where, you know, most, most pipe transactions are still happening. Tommy Chong wasn't that far, you know, wasn't that, um, yeah. you know, wasn't that prior, much prior. And, uh, um, he got arrested. I'm stumbling on my words because I'm so tired. Um, uh, yeah. So Tommy Chong wasn't that, that much farther before that. And, all of these transactions are either happening by phone or in person. So you're going to a head shop or you're traveling around the country in a van selling pipes. And so I show up at their North store with this rack and he says, how much? And I literally have a, a handwritten invoice and I'm like, okay, how about a dollar 50 each? And he's like, listen, kid, 
you can sell them to me for $1.50 or $2.50, and I'm still going to sell these things for $9. And you know, again, now they're cheaper, but the you know, but at the time, I mean, we're talking about a one hitter for not, for under 10 bucks. It was kind of unheard of. And um, and so I was like, well, it's $2.50. And I was off to the races because all of a sudden, this product that was costing me maybe 50 cents to make, I was now selling instead of $1.50, $2.50. So you know, immediately I start selling these things you know, by the truckload and, you know, I'm calling up all of my accounts saying, Hey, you know, so-and-so it's Dave, the Gravitron guy. I've got this new one hitter. It comes in this rack. Will you take some? Sure. Dave, the Gravitron guy, I'll take some of these. <laughs> so I was, you know, it was, it was, it was the first time I realized like, Hey, if I can make something that is like the, you know, the most basic model of a cannabis delivery system, I might be able to bring something meaningful to market at a really competitive price. Because despite the fact that I was making more money than I thought I could make on it, it was still a great value for the customers. Yeah. Um, now a lot has changed since then, obviously, but, um, but it's really what dictated the rest of the catalog. I mean, if we had a montage to go right now, I would show you, you know, right after that came the spoon, then the basic bubbler, then the basic bong, then, you know, the steamroller. And I mean, like it just, the, and the catalog goes on and on and on where I realized, okay, I can distill this stuff down to the most basic version. And the, the biggest secret to the whole thing was that that decal that, you, that you're pointing to right there, this is a, a throwback to Roar. So like, you know, most of the people, if you've heard of Grab, you probably know Roar. And yeah. Roar was, I'm pr you know, probably not the first, but one of the first to do a fired on de decal on their, on their bongs. Um, mm -hmm. and do glass on glass fittings. So, um, you know, I always thought that that Roar logo was super sexy and I wanted to put my logo on all of the pipes. Roar never did it on anything s smaller than a bong at yeah. the time. And no one put their name fired on with a decal on a pipe before I started making these, these one hitters. And so I, um, and so I started, you know, after the tasters worked, I started immediately going, okay, well, this is not only an amazing little pipe with my name on it, but it's getting my brands, you know, it's a flywheel. It's getting my brand yeah. out there. How people want to buy the next thing with grab on it, the next thing with grab. And so it was the first exercise in brand building, which really wasn't happening in this industry at all. I know it seems ridiculous, but like even still today, there's only a couple of brands that you can think of in the consumption device industry, right? It's grab. Mm -hmm. Puffco, Raw, Roar, you know, name another. Maybe, Pats, maybe, maybe right? Grinko, but they don't, it's not glass. No one knows what Grinko is. Everyone knows, you know, G-Pen, right? Like, yeah, yeah you know, you know G-Pen, but like, you know, the, and, and that's, you know, that's a great, you know, very big brand, Volcano, right? But again, the list is maybe dozens long, not even, you know, but, you know, you get into the, you know, this, this is the, you know, there are, tens of thousands of glass blowers out there and there are um and there are tens of thousands of other product makers out out in the, the cannabis head shop you know delivery device world and um and I, you know it was a it was a really amazing moment with that taster to realize that this is the the not only the moment that was going to get me out of debt but it dictated the the building of a brand, which I really hadn't been doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I so I look at your timeline and everything else, and I can say I probably started getting into cannabis around realistically like 2010, 2011. And then I remember, you know, when I, when I started looking at some more devices, I, I had to be maybe two years ago, right? Because I told you before this, I'm, I'm, I'm a very much a, a filter and paper guy. Um, but I... I didn't even know where else to look besides Grav, right? I, I heard of Grav, I, Grav, I had gone to Austin pretty often. And, you know, I noticed that you guys didn't even launch e-commerce till 2017, which is why I'm saying it had to be after 2017 because I bought my first stuff online from you guys. And then fast forward to Vegas this past year in December, I went hard in your booth the last day of MJ BizCon. But outside of that, everything I've gotten has been from your website. Um, 
And, and on that note, I know we talked about the products and everything, and you can tell I, I skip all over the place here, but you dealt with a lot of the issues that the cannabis industry is, is dealing with now well before everybody else. So, you know, I remember saying um, when you wanted to scale the company, you went to, to Bank of America for a loan and they barely gave you a line of credit, even though your, your company had a decent valuation around it. You know, you couldn't get banks to work with you or you couldn't access traditional finance that, you know, you, you and then e-com, right? You said Tommy Chong, I forget the name of it, it was Operation Pipe Dream. Tommy Chong went to jail for, for selling paraphernalia, right? Um, I, so I noticed at that point, you know, you guys had started saying that it was for tobacco, but you, you can't advertise online. You can't do e-com. And you can't get traditional financing. So realistically, not only had you had a tough entrepreneurial journey to that point, but now you have to figure out how to do business when you can't access traditional business means. What's that like? Um, well, first of all, it's still hard. We still have merchant processing challenges. Um, we still have and, bank challenges, although we have a great local bank that is, you know, has been wonderful to us. Um, the, the story with Bank of America wasn't even that they would, you know, give us a small loan. They basically said, "Oh, you want a line of credit? We just looked at your business. We're not even interested in banking you anymore. You can get your stuff out. You, you, you basically wow. can get your take your business and go elsewhere immediately." Um, and that's, you know, for the most part, still the case. I mean, I recently, you know, spoke to Chase about, you know, a, a loan and. They did some background check on me and said, oh, hey, listen, I'm sorry, we can't work with you, right? Like this, you know, we are far from, you know, getting, you know, any sort of real opportunities in cannabis for, for banking. And to be honest with you, and not to tie it back to this, this is yet another like social justice thing, right? Like the fact that, you know, there's zero access to real, you know, institutional capital to, you know, to, to, to banks, at a, you know, the most basic, you know, American right to be able to bank, it, you know, is the most absurd thing. It's, it's yet another moat for most people to be getting in. You know, it's, I mean, hey, kudos for us. We've got the means to be able to figure it out, navigate it, but man, yeah. that can just squash you. I mean, literally we just, we just launched grabcbd.com, not doing great. We love it and maybe it will pick up soon, but it took us months to get that thing launched. And we've oh, yeah. got all the means in the world, you know? um, and it's uh, you know it's been um, it's been it's it's been really um, it's been an exercise in patience over time and really trying to cast as many nets as possible. And there are people that are going to come onto this, you know, you know, into the comment section and be like, "I can bank you, I can bank you." I, you know, like, listen, they all say everybody says that they can that they can bank you. Everybody says they can do your merchant processing until it gets to underwriting and they're like, oh yeah, no problem. Just take out every mention of cannabis and every mention of CBD and every, so basically just, just don't, don't have a website, but we can, yeah. we can do your merchant processing. <laughs> it's absurd. So um, yeah, I mean, the barriers are, are endless and it's really tough. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people who get into this industry and think that they can kind of bootstrap and everything else. And then you hit all these speed bumps and it, it's not easy. And I was going to say that you guys are basically 100% non-plant touching, but I know that you have some partnerships going on where that is somewhat changed. I know Grav kind of as a whole, and I'm sure you have corporate structures in place to make sure everything's protected, but I almost look at this as kind of coming full circle, right? So you did the Gravitron, you did the taster, you started coming out with the basic version of all your stuff. And now you guys have some incredible things. And I'm going to get into what this is right here a little bit, because this is literally my favorite thing in the entire world. This thing is on me all the time, but you are now in, in States where it's legal. And I think it's more so in just California doing glass joints. Now I saw this at the NCIA show in San Jose and, it is one of the coolest things that I have ever seen. It is basically kind of almost like you think in theory, like it, it's two pieces of glass with a grommet in the middle. One of them has the, the weed in it and you have a thing that fills seven of them at a time. And I even read, I don't know if this is the right pricing, but it's $40 for an eighth. I mean, that, that, that's great pricing. And just so you know, in Florida, they're, they're charging $50 for an eighth of just ground flour with this. You get 
eight, you know, seven, eight pieces of glass with it. What gave you the idea for the glass joint and, and how did you pursue that one? Or, or, or did someone come to you for that? Well, first of all, sorry for all you Florida people who live in an oligopoly and it is the biggest bullshit market ever, but hundred um, <laughs> percent, uh, but that's why you're paying 50 bucks, you know, open it up and that'll get better. Um, and uh, yeah, so we launched glass joints in California strategically, you know, a, because California, if you can make it in California, you can make it anywhere, but B, because, um, you know, it was also one of the easier uh, states to structurally operate in. So, you know, the residency requirements are kind to, um, to businesses that want to license their brand in California. Um, that's not to say that it's easy to do business in California because of, you know, lots of employment laws, et cetera. But, um, but it seemed like the right move for us. And, you know, to be more specific where we launched it's, if anybody on, you know, is on here is familiar with the grab glass blunt, it's basically the same thing, but we engineered the blunt down to be, you know, to feel a little bit more disposable. And instead of holding about a gram, it holds a half a gram. So, um, and then we sell it in like a little, like, you know, like a, um, like a six shooter revolver type of package, Yeah. So, but, it, but it has seven cartridges, half a gram each and a mouthpiece in the middle. Um, you know, it was, uh, it's, it's just launched in March in, you know, in the midst of COVID. And so it's been, um, you know, it, it was a huge launch, which was amazing, but we're, you know, we have to wait to see how the dust settles in California with COVID to really um, understand how people are reacting to the product. Um, of course, we love it and we're iterating on top of it constantly, but you're right, like this is the, um, this is our pivot to, to really kind of sticking our flag in the ground and saying, hey, we're not afraid of saying it anymore. We are a cannabis brand. Um, I think that everybody since 2004 that went and bought a gravity bong from, you know, that said Gravitron on it has said, has thought about Gravitron and thought cannabis or thought weed, you know, back in the day, cannabis, cannabis, the word has really come yeah. around. Right. Uh, so, um, you know, whereas like it, it wasn't, you know, maybe six years ago, we were still saying, Hey, this is all for tobacco use only. Right. Like, you know, there's no cannabis here. Don't, don't look over here. And now we're, you know, coming out and saying, hey, we are selling product with effectively grab branded weed in it. And we're standing behind that flower and we are confident in the way it smokes. Um, but more importantly, it's a statement that, you know, hey, we're not going to hide behind this, this veil of, of, uh, of illegality anymore. I, I highly, and I think that's really cool. I, I love seeing you get behind the movement, if you will. And, you know, to me, you guys are one of the, like I said, the OGs in, in the industry, right? You were helping people consume well before it was ever legal. And now that you're able to come out and say that you're a cannabis company is absolutely incredible. I think the fact that I look at the glass joint as almost a variation of this, um, you know, it brings you full circle to, to going back to having something that is low cost, scalable, but does a phenomenal job. Um, I had the, the site up earlier. I think it's Grab Canna. Um, I highly recommend people go check that out because it, it really is one of the coolest things that I've seen. And I didn't get to see the six shooter thing in action, but I was able to grab one of those at the NCIA show. And it was, it was very, very enjoyable. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to go check that out the next time. I'm on the West coast for sure. Um, but going into it, you know, your design process has got to be incredible because you take things that are so simple and just make them better. Right. And where I've been trying to get to is I want to say in like 2012, 2013, I was introduced into what a dugout was right now. I'm a golfer and I like to consume on the golf course. It goes hand in hand. It actually helps me with my game to a point. Right. And the dugout became my go-to way of using it on the golf course. When I found the grab dugout, I mean, dude, this is a game changer to me. And I feel like I sound like Guy Fieri in a kitchen, but, you know, it's so simple, but so effective. Just the fact that all this is metal, you've got little teeth on here. So when you, when you go to get your stuff, it breaks it up, helps pack it. And then this, this stupid little thing right on the bottom that helps clear your, your, your one hitter there. I mean, for anybody who's ever used a dugout, 
it, it's like, you know, I used to make the joke when we were in the golf course that when we use the one hitter, it was like taking shots with a musket, right? You pack it up, you hit it, and then you got to like take your golf tee or something, get like a, a pen or something and poke through it and clean everything out. It literally is just like taking a musket. This is literally pack, hit it, turn it, done. You know, how did you guys take the idea of just taking something as simple as a dugout and making it into this just very convenient modern version. I mean, even the, 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 the pouch that it comes in is so convenient. And I know that that's me fanning out, but I, I just love how your mind works when you're like, I can take that and I can make it better. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish that that's one of the products that I could take some credit for, but uh, absolutely zero credit from my, you know, on me, for me personally, but my design team is incredible. Um, I need that guy on the podcast then. Just kidding. Yeah, well, it's it's a team, you know. I think they would all want you know you know equal credit, and uh, you know, Micah and Travis and Stephen, who's who who recently left the company, all collaborated to to bring that to market, which has been um, you know a huge seller for us. But you know, none you know, amazingly, none of our product categories really dominate. I mean, we've got over three hundred SKUs, and there isn't a single item that represents more than four percent of the business. So, um, you know, it's a really, it's a testament to, to, to A, the diversity of our customers and what they're looking for, um, and B, that, um, you know, that, that people are, you know, really specific in what they want. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that one was definitely a win. And one of our first forays outside of glass. So, like, you know, really after my heart, and, and it makes me, makes me all warm and fuzzy to know that you like it. Oh, I have, a question, I, I, I have a question for you though. Uh-huh. So do you think that we should try to make the pre-filled tasters instead of the pre-filled glass joints? So I like the idea of the pre-filled tasters before I found the grab dugout, I would actually buy, uh, you know, a, a few of these, you sell them in bundles, yeah. fill them and then have like four or five of them in the golf bag with me. And then you would throw them away? For, I would try to clean them. I'd try to reuse them. But after a few, it wasn't like use it once and throw it away. It was use it a few times. And then when I got too lazy to clean it, throw it away. Got it. Okay. Just doing a little R&D. So, <laughs> absolutely. No, if you, I mean, you take this thing, you put a little rubber cap on the end. This is, you know, going back to the glass joint and, and dude, what I would give to, to come to your office in Austin and just sit in a whiteboarding session with your design team um, to me to be a fly on the wall would be absolutely incredible. But you know, sometimes this is just enough, right? This, this is the amount that you need right there. So you're able to have this, maybe a little rubber cap on it, put it in your pocket, walk out back, light it real quick. Um, you know, some people might throw it away after one use. Some people might try to reuse it, but I, to me, that's a great idea. Yeah, we're 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 all in on this on this model of of creating you know more and more disposable glass products. That um, I mean, glass is you know inert. It's recyclable. It's you know just you know we're we're in a world where the the people still covet their pipes, right? Yeah. They, they clean them. They you know they, they they take really good care of them. If they break, they're upset about it. You know, there it wasn't that long ago from a humanity perspective that we didn't have beer bottles yet. Now we just throw them away. Yeah. And the, you know, to think that we're, you know, that we're going to forever be cleaning our glass pipes and, you know, reusing them is a little absurd. Um, mark my words. I might be early on this, but, um, but that's, that's where we're going. No, I, I, I can absolutely agree with you. And you think about it, it kind of follows the trend of the industry, right? For the longest time, it was something you did in privacy in your house. So if you had a bowl or you had a pipe, you had it in your house somewhere. You know, some people were proud and they put it on display. Other people had it hidden. You know, some of us were parents, we have it away. And you also have to clean it because you don't want it to smell. You don't want it to stink. And you also want it to work well, right? Now that cannabis to me, and then this is 100% my opinion, um, now that cannabis has become more accessible, you know, if I travel to California, I'm getting it there. I think the delivery mechanisms need to be more disposable and more portable. Um, and innovation is, is going to happen in any industry, right? So, you know, the, I think the smallest part of the industry 
is going to be the folks like myself that buy whole flour, break it up and either roll a joint or put it in a, in a bong or a bowl, right? That is the traditional side of the industry. But as we look at this is not just, you know, recreational, not just medical, but really just from a wellness standpoint, delivery mechanisms are going to get more controlled from, from a dosing standpoint. And I think they're going to be more disposable because, you know, you're a parent, I'm a parent, right? I know it, it's going to be an interesting conversation when we have to have it with our kids and, you know, I don't know if my show's going to stick around, but you've got a successful company. So that's going to come up. Um, you still, to me, I'm still on the fence. I don't want to say on the fence about kids with, with, with cannabis because we've all tried it. I don't think it should be regular use there. And, and listen, I have no medical education. So whether I'm right or wrong, if people want to complain about it, I'm sorry. That's my opinion. I think they need to wait till they get older. But, you know, at some point you kind of want it to be a little bit discreet and not smell. So I can 100% see where you're coming from with having these disposable delivery mechanisms and to have something that's glass that's cheap enough to be able to dispose it you know, that's giving you the familiar experience that you have with the ability to toss it away and get another one. Yeah. So yeah, for the record, I'm with you on the kids. I also don't think that they should drive till they're 18, but you know, (laughs) who might have said? Yeah. Uh, I live Um, in Florida. I I think they shouldn't drive till they're 18 and they should stop driving when they're 64. Um, (laughs) Touche. But yeah, man, listen, I, listen, I know you're a new dad. I know sleep is rough. I know I've taken up probably the better part of an hour of your day. And Dave, dude, I can literally sit here and make this a three, four hour Joe Rogan type podcast, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, dude, you've, you've done so much. The, the company is so good. I definitely want to have you back on. Let me ask you a quick question. You know, I, I was reading about the, the Gravitrons that you built in the beginning. Do you still have some of those first ones, the, the Jim Beam bottle, the first wine bottle? Do you have those anywhere? Or have those been long gone now? Yeah, I have, I have what I call Gravitron number one, but it wasn't really number one because there was a lot of like, you know, the, the, yeah, that first, um, I actually think it was a, did I say somewhere else it was Jim Beam? Maybe I thought it was a Seagram's bottle. Anyways, I, whatever, I, whatever that first one was where I like took it to Ben's Wanger and was like, hey, I'm making a vase for Mother's Day. Can you, <laughs> you know, I can, whatever that one was, I don't have that one anymore. I'm almost positive it broke, you know, and, you know, as it should in the most poetic way, you know, I, I don't, I wish I could tell you, oh, come to Austin. I've got this amazing archive of all of the products that we've made in the past, but I'm just not that guy. I will literally throw away. I, I, I'm the anti hoarder, right? Like, you know, the moment that I think that something is, is no longer worth my while, I try to either give it away on Craigslist or throw it away. So, um, so no, I don't have a lot of, of relics, but we do have a very cool campus. And if you ever get down to Austin, you're welcome to come and check it out. Dude, I will absolutely come to Austin. I love Austin. I even wrote down like all my favorite spots in Austin to, to talk to you about, but clearly we have way too much to talk about. So we didn't even get to touch on Austin, but have you ever been my out? So, so obviously I love food. You can tell by how tight this t-shirt is. Um, dude, have you ever been out to Valentina's their, their breakfast taco, the real deal Holyfield? You know what? I read about it recently and no, I haven't amazingly. And I'm actually, I kind of, you know, am a, a taco connoisseur, I would say, but, and I, and, and I just wasn't on my radar for whatever reason, but I will definitely check it out. Um, Dude, I, um, I love the breast, breakfast tacos in Austin. Um, it's probably an out of towner opinion, but taco deli is one of my favorite places to go to. And when I went there with my wife, we looked up best breakfast taco in Austin and that one was on every list. Um, I did some consulting for a company in Austin for a little bit. And the CEO of that company took me out to Valentina's. It's like 20 minutes outside of downtown, but I can promise you it's worth the drive. It's one of the best breakfast foods I've ever had. Yeah. You know, the running joke in Austin is like, is, are you a, ta- are you taco deli or are you torchies? So, you know, it's like, you know, the, the two, they're two distinctly different type of people. If you like, you know, if you're, if you're a Torchy's breakfast taco guy, or if you're a taco deli breakfast taco guy, you can just size someone up. It's like being able to understand their personality and their question. So are, are you Torchy's or a taco deli? Oh, I'm a taco deli. Yeah. You, you, you the, the correct answer is taco deli. <laughs> so, so I'm glad I'm in good company then. I actually, uh, what was it? The taco deli off Mopac, right? Right. Yeah, um, in front of the yeah, nature. The 
Yeah. So I used to work, I used to do some work with SHI right there. And, um, dude, I would eat there twice a day. I would eat there for lunch and then they closed at, at like four 30. So I'd go at three 30 and grab one on the way back to my hotel. Um, and I, I actually asked Taco Deli, I said, I want to franchise your business in Florida. And they told me no. So <laughs> I'm a little sour, but I will, dude, I might make a trip to Austin just to hang out with you. I'm dead serious. Um, thank you so much for doing this show, but I want to give you a, a chance to promote anything that you're doing, anything, any new releases that you guys have coming up or just even promote your website. You've got a ton of great information on the website. I really enjoyed your blog. Um, you know, I wish I saw the 11 discreet spots to uh, smoke in Austin back when I used to go there all the time. But uh, even you have a, a list of top cannabis podcasts and I, I'm going to need you to reconsider that list when you go back and watch this episode. <laughs> Indeed, I will. Um, yeah, you know, nothing serious to promote. I mean, we've got obviously, you know, go check us out on on Instagram at Grav Labs, and um, and also check out the new uh, GravCBD.com. Tell me what you think. If you hate it, if you love it, it'd be great. Absolutely. Well, Dave, thank you again so much for doing the show. Really appreciate it. We're we're definitely gonna get you back on. Um, and and uh, that's it, show. man. We're, what's that? Next time, live show in person. Yes. Well, next time, no, next time we're, we're going to do, we're going to rip off some of these food truck shows. Maybe it'll just be you and me in front of a Valentina's eating a real deal Holyfield talking <laughs> about some of the new products you guys have come out. Hopefully, hopefully we have the budget for the show to do that soon. Sounds good, man. Thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. It's fun. No problem. Well, thank you for, thank you again for doing the show and thank you everybody at home for watching. This has been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. Uh, go to the website, joincelab.com. Check out our marketing and branding panel tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Eastern. Register as my guest, Todd Rosales. Guys, thank you for watching the show. This has been one of my favorite episodes. I hope you enjoyed it and you guys have a good night.